John Searle is an American philosopher and professor emeritus of philosophy from the University of California at Berkeley. He is well known in the philosophy of science for his Chinese room, a thought experiment in which he attempts to dispel popular notions about computation and consciousness. It was really on United Airlines at 30,000 feet that I thought of the Chinese room. And then I got very depressed because I thought, well, they must have thought of that. I mean, it's such a simple point that anybody would have thought of it. And I thought also, since they've thought of it, they must have thought of a reply to it. And what am I going to talk about for the rest of the week to an artificial intelligence group? But in fact, they hadn't thought of it. And they didn't know what the reply was. Everybody was convinced I was wrong, but they all had quite different reasons for supposing I was wrong. In brief, the Chinese room asked this. Imagine you do not speak or read in any dialect of Chinese. This shouldn't be hard for some of us but are given a perfect dictionary that translates written Chinese words and phrases into your native tongue and are locked in a booth with a one-way mirror. In this situation, it would be impossible for a person who is able to read and write in Chinese to distinguish you from a native speaker, yet no one would say that they understand Chinese if put in this situation. This thought experiment overlaps some of the considerations of Alan Turing, the British genius who invented the modern programmable computer and perhaps the most influential thinker in the hard artificial intelligence camp. Searle's ideas will be contrasted with the late Marvin Minsky's, from whom we will hear later in another short on the subject of artificial intelligence. If you want to read John Searle's original 1980 paper, Minds, Brains, and Programs, it's still available online for free in its entirety. Searle warned against taking an overly materialist or behaviorist approach to these questions. His comments here are from a 1988 British broadcasting interview on the subject of machine thinking. There is in a lot of people, uh, both in and out of academic life, the idea that, look, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if you've got a machine that can answer questions as good as uh, the, the, those of a native Chinese speaker, and it can take uh, questions as input and produce the right answers as output, and can make the right inferences, then it must understand Chinese, because after all, that's all there is to understanding Chinese, is, is exhibiting the right behavior. For Professor Searle, it is important that we meet a computation machine at the level of computation and simulation at the level of simulation. The point of it is to show that symbol manipulating by itself isn't sufficient for having mental states and processes. Now, the reason that that's important is, of course, that the computer just is a symbol manipulating device. That's the definition of the digital computer. It's a symbol manipulator. And what the Chinese room argument shows is that symbol manipulation doesn't give you mental states. We must resist the temptation to draw from truly astounding and revolutionary technologies conclusions about the nature of their creators or of the universe itself, lest we find ourselves in the position of the figures of the Western Enlightenment pondering if the universe is some kind of great clockwork mechanism, a view born of the inspired imagination of people who could see the potential but not the limits of the new mechanical philosophy of Sir Isaac Newton. Well, there's a puzzling thing about simulation. Of course, any process at all that you can give a formal description of can be simulated on a digital computer. So I can do simulations of the patterns of rainstorms in London or the patterns of uh, five alarm fires in Chicago or, for that matter, the pattern of money flow through the, Brit the British Broadcasting Corporation. But nobody supposes that a simulation of a rainstorm is going to leave us all wet, or that a simulation of, of the pattern of expenditure by the BBC is going to make us all rich. But for some crazy reason, when it comes to the mind, they think if we simulated the mind, we've created a mind. Searle's remarks could be seen as a response to some of the 20th century structuralist ghosts still haunting the hard sciences today. We suffer from this illusion that all substantive problems must have some sort of technological or scientific solution. We suffer from the, the belief that if only we had a better technology, if only we had a, a more advanced science in a certain area, then the substantive problems would be solved. If only, to put it very crudely, if we could just replace Reagan and Gorbachev with two supercomputers, they would surely be able to come to an agreement on arms control or on how to run the world. 
But can't we go beyond logic and language? As computers become more powerful and use less energy and technology advances, won't we eventually be able to simulate reality to a molecular resolution, maybe even quantum? Here we would still miss the mark on simulation, computation, biology, and physics, according to Professor Searle. Suppose we did not a program at the level of uh, uh, Chinese characters, but suppose we did a program which simulated the formal structure of the Chinese brain. Suppose we had a step in the program corresponding to every neuron firing at the synapse of, in, the brain, in the neuron of a brain of a native Chinese speaker. Well, wouldn't that system understand Chinese, since after all, we've now got a simulation of the Chinese brain? But again, I think you can see what's wrong with this. It's simulating the wrong things about the brain. What it's simulating is just the formal pattern of neuron firing and not the actual biochemistry. See, what matters about the human brain is not just that it's got a formal structure, because you could put that formal structure in anything. You could do a model of a human brain out of old beer cans. Take a billion old Whitbread cans and let them bang together to simulate the way neurons fire. You don't get what matters about the brain, namely, not that it's just got this formal structure. We can do that with beer cans or, or old rose petals, anything you like. But what matters is a specific biochemistry. So the brain simulator reply really is a, a kind of deeply anti-scientific. It's deeply anti-biological because it neglects what is so fantastic, so amazing about the human brain, namely that the specific biochemistry of the brain causes us to have specific thoughts and feelings and so on. We're talking about biology, that, and, and biology, after all, is a specific discipline. It isn't a branch of mathematics. You can't do biology with beer cans. Some of the difficulties we have in imparting conceptual structures to machines are due in part to the limitations of conceptions themselves. Gerdelian limitations on mathematical expression, the problems of set theory, and the inability of positivist thinking to justify itself in positivist terms. The inherent difficulty that comes from discovering the limits of just what it is about human lived experience that can and cannot be expressed in purely symbolic terms. We're tempted to think that because everything in the world is physical, that therefore there ought to be a science of everything in a way that there is a science of physics. But what we forget when we say that is that the way that we talk about the world, the things that interest us, the categories that we apply, cut across the physical categories. So even if you think of ordinary things, think of a picnic, for example. Now, of course, a picnic is a physical event. I mean, roughly speaking, no molecules, no picnic. Uh, every time there's a picnic, there's a whole lot of molecules in motion. But nonetheless, there isn't such a thing as a science of picnics. Why not? Well, um, to put it very simply, because there isn't any physical property that all picnics have in common that make them picnics. So there's no way we're going to study, as it were, the systematic physical properties of picnics. Now, we're not so much interested in picnics, but we are interested in political parties and economic movements and revolutions and so on. And I want to say, in this respect, they are all like picnics. They're not grounded in some simple way in the physical properties of the world. There isn't any physical property that all money has in common, or that all revolutionary movements have in common, or all political parties have in common. Now, we can study these systematically, and the social sciences give us the possibility of systematically studying these things. But it's an illusion to suppose, as many people do, that what we're looking for in the sciences of man, in these sorts of disciplines, is something like physics, that we're waiting for our Newton to come along and give us the basic laws of politics or laws of psychology. Our sense of self and our sense of being, says Professor Searle, are as intuitively unshakable as our subjective experience of hearing and vision, as distinct from the physical phenomena of sound and light. We have no means nor reason to deny the reality of our sense of our ability to make choices or our sense of smell or taste or touch.
Why do we still have this problem? I mean, you'd think after 2,000 years we'd have got rid of it. But we still have it, I'm convinced, because there is a conflict between our own experience of our own freedom. It's just a fact about the experience of our life that whatever we do as a matter of conscious voluntary action, we sense the possibility of alternatives. I could be raising this arm or this arm or neither arm or I could be crossing my arms. At any given moment in my life, I am confronted with an indefinite range of choices and that experience of freedom, my knowledge that I could be doing something different and I, having done something, I know I could have done something else, all other conditions remaining the same, is it's that experience that gives us the sort of gut feel of our own free will. Nobody is going to talk us out of that feeling. Stay tuned for Marvin Minsky on the other side of the artificial intelligence coin. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.